Anyways, uh, it is my great honor and privilege to introduce Kirk McCusick. Um, he's going to give a talk, Narrative History of BSD. So this is actually a three-hour lecture, but I don't have three hours. So there's, uh, this is where I, I allow audience participation. So the, the, the lecture is really sort of three main parts. And what I'll do is uh, describe the three main parts, then everyone will get to vote on which part they find the most interesting. And then what I, I won't, I used to just do just that part, and I got a lot of negative feedback about that. So I'll do whatever two parts don't get elected in, I'll just do quickly, and then I'll concentrate on the, the one piece that seems to be the most popular. So the history of uh, BSD, this is BSD at Berkeley as opposed to once it's out into the, the open source world. Uh, so the first period of time is what I call the Bill Joy era. Uh, and this is where Bill Joy is starting up BSD and is really getting it rolling and sort of ends when he departs and funds this, uh, or starts up this company called Sun Microsystems, which you may have heard of. Um, and then the second part is sort of the heyday of BSD. So this is the period of time where everybody is you know, running it. It's 4.2 and 4.3 and so on. And uh, during that period of time, we were being funded by DARPA, which they probably have a microphone somewhere in this room. Um, at any rate, uh, there was some very interesting uh, battles that went on uh, about exactly how TCP ought to be implemented and uh, a lot of the sort of history that, that that all percolates out. And so that's sort of the middle period. And then the end period is where we have gotten religion and have decided that you know, maybe BSD isn't going to be at Berkeley forever. And if we want there to be any possibility of it to continue, uh, we'd better figure out how to get it outside of the university to people that, other than to people that are licensed by AT&T Bell Laboratories. And so it's the whole story of how we open sourced it and fought a long lawsuit about that and so on and so forth. So those are the three main parts, the Bill Joy, the, the middle TCP building years, and the lawsuit years at the end. So how many people are most interested in hearing the Bill Joy years? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay. How many people are interested in hearing sort of the middle era? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. All right. Seventeen, eighteen, nine, twenty, four, twenty-five. Okay. And how many people want to hear the open source lawsuit, etc.? <laughs> okay. You see, this is why I ask. <laughs> it's usually it's it's interesting because I get different different groups vote for different things. When I was in Japan, they all want to hear about the lawsuit, you know, because I guess they don't have those in Japan. Yeah, story is well known here. yeah actually, that story is quite well known here. Uh, in fact, the, the sort of interesting tidbit is that uh, through a Freedom of Information Act, California Freedom of Information Act, uh, we were able to get the uh, decision on that lawsuit unsealed so that the actual text could get out, which was sort of interesting reading. Okay, well, for those of you who are interested in a section that I'm not doing, uh, this is where I get a, to make a shameless plug for my DVD. This is the entire three-and-a-half-hour version of this lecture, uh, which I conveniently have a box of up here. So if, if it's worth $20 to you, you can get one of these and walk away with it. Okay, so uh, unlike most of my talks, I don't actually have a laptop with slides on it. I just have these handwritten notes. And the top line of my handwritten note says, the first four pages of this were written on the Indian Pacific train on the way to Perth in January 1986 because I had to give the lecture the day I arrived. Uh, <laughs> so I'd been uh, told that this was what my talk was going to be, and I was unprepared. So it's sort of bouncy up and down uh, handwriting, but uh, it was the early history. So at any rate, um, we're just going to zip quickly through, but BSD started at Berkeley. Uh, by Bill Joy. Uh, Bill Joy was a graduate student. I happened to share the same advisor with him. We were both working on programming languages. Uh, you might find that hard to believe, considering that he did the seashell, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> at any rate, uh, that's what we were doing. And uh, so I shared an office with him, and along with three other graduate students. Uh, and so I 
sort of was sitting there watching a lot of this unfolding. And in fact, Bill was very good at getting other people enthusiastic about doing work. It was the typical comment was, well, how hard can it be? You could just knock this off in a couple hours. Uh, and usually you could knock off that one thing, but of course that would then get you sucked in and uh, you, know, you ended up writing the entire Pascal interpreter or you know, <laughs> back end or something. Uh, at any rate, uh, Bill started doing initially just utilities. So it was the seashell, uh, the EX editor later uh, also became the VI editor, uh, the Pascal system. And so he started packaging these things up and sending out tapes to people and uh, then when uh, Ken Thompson, who had been a, an alumnus of Berkeley, uh, was out for a one-year sabbatical and had brought Unix with him, when he left, Bill sort of took over running the system, what we would call a system administrator today. Uh, at any rate, this got him interested in the system. There were patches that were coming back from AT&T. He was putting those in. He was then making some others, sending them back to AT&T. And uh, so over time, there were sort of bigger and bigger bits of the system, and he finally got tired of trying to track what other people's Unixes looked like. And so uh, with the advent of 3BSD, the third distribution, he just put together an entire package. Um, and this was actually for the VAX rather than the PDP-11, which is what we had started on. Uh, all the two-dot versions of the of BSD were actually worked on by other people, not by Bill. So especially the, the stuff where the kernel begins to become involved, uh, 2.9, 10, 11, et cetera, uh, was actually done by uh, other people many years uh, later. So 2.11 does not precede 3.0. Uh, 2.11 is you know, contemporary with 4.4. Uh, at any rate, uh, once we got the, uh, the BSD distribution out into the world, uh, it started getting used by a lot of people because it really was a big step forward over what AT&T was shipping. Um, in particular, uh, as we started getting things like uh, TCP IP networking, uh, so you had a choice. You could run the AT&T version, which had UUCP as the networking, or you could run BSD that had sockets, TCP, et cetera. Uh, you could run AT&T's version, which had a file system that could utilize 3 to 5% of the bandwidth of the disk, or you could run BSD, which could utilize 50% of the bandwidth of the disk, et cetera. So, Many people would buy the AT&T license and then immediately drop Berkeley uh, Unix onto it. Uh, consequently, it was getting wide distribution, at least in the university environments, uh, and uh, starting to sort of eke out into the commercial environments. And that was, I mean, the commercial environments were not large because commercial environments just weren't using Unix at that time, uh, for the most part. Uh, so at any rate, um, Bill got it, uh, well, with 3, 3 BSD coming out, um, the DARPA, uh, which is essentially covered, uh, puts out research contracts for uh, all the different branches of the military, uh, was had a huge number of contracts out uh, with lots of different people doing stuff related to computers, and they all had different computers and different operating systems, and they were using different languages. And so one group would do something. They just couldn't really pass that over to some other group that might want to utilize it because this was written in Fortran and that was written in PL1 and you know this was running on you know some DEC machine and that was running on some IBM hardware etc. And so DARPA decided that they really wanted to <laughs> consolidate um, on hardware and operating system and then have people work there so there was a better chance that they would be able to cooperate. So they put out a, a sort of call essentially a request for proposals or whatever they called it in those days. And uh, essentially there were two uh, main contending things that came in. One was the VAX running VMS and the other one was the VAX running Berkeley Unix. And of course the, uh, the people that were promoting the VAX running VMS you know, we're arguing like, well, you know, this is a real vendor-supported operating system, and you know, it, it's not just some flaky students at Berkeley that are doing it, and you know, therefore, this ought to be the operating system. And then to, to really put the final nail in the co coffin, uh, uh, this guy named Dave Cashton came up with a set of benchmarks, uh, what we would call micro benchmarks today. So, how fast can you do get PID, and how fast, you know, that pipe thing where you ping single packet back and forth to see how fast you can context switch and so on. And uh, 
showed that VMS did these things much faster than BSD did. And this, of course, made Bill go ballistic. And uh, besides saying that they were the stupidest benchmarks he'd ever seen, he says, if that's the way they're going to decide, then we'll just go and make those things run fast. And it was sort of an interesting story about how that happened. But uh, he got the, the BSD to run those benchmarks as fast as VMS. And uh, so the upshot of it was that DARPA uh, you know, was still sort of sitting on the fence. And Bill's comment was, well, with VMS, you're stuck with the VAX forever. And you know, maybe some other computer might be interesting down the road. And BSD is set up so that it's much more portable. It's, you know, it's tied, Unix in general is you know, portable across different architectures. We've already proved it by running it you know, for n equals 2. Therefore, you know, it's a proved point. <laughs> uh, so at any rate, uh, DARPA agreed to that. And they put in some initial money to Berkeley. And the initial thing to Berkeley was really just uh, to come up with uh, well, we had put out 3BSD, which had a lot of functionality in it, but the performance wasn't so great. And so the, the first point was to get 4BSD out, which was going to have sort of that, that additional functionality that they really felt they needed, uh, which was just a l fairly small tweaks. Uh, things like the ability to automatically reboot after crash, uh, job control, uh, Franz Lisp, which was needed by a bunch of their uh, folks. Uh, Deliver Mail snuck in there. That was the uh, <laughs> predecessor to Send Mail, except without a configuration file. You just compiled in the, ch the way you needed things to work. Uh, at any rate, um, that came out, and then 4.1 sort of nailed it down, cleaned it up, got the performance decent, and that fulfilled the first DARPA contract. Well, DARPA had put in something like, you know, three quarters of a million dollars or something, and boom, you know, got this huge payback from it, and people seemed to be happy with it, so they decided maybe the, the funky graduate students at Berkeley could do stuff, and so then they put in a, a considerably larger uh, contract. It was, I don't remember what it was, three or five million dollars or something, uh, and this was a longer term. In those, you t in those times, you would get, uh, for example, a three-year contract, uh, which is sort of unheard of in a lot of the research stuff today. Um, so you could really sort of spend some time figuring out what you're going to do and then do it for you know, 18 months to two years before you had to start working about renewing, et cetera. Um, at any rate, uh, the, the grand goals for this big contract that DARPA gave was uh, there were four pieces to it. One was to get uh, real networking in. Um, at that time, uh, there was just NCP, uh, which was the network control protocol, the predecessor to TCP IP. Uh, a good file system in there, uh, restartable signals so that you could actually use them to drive work as opposed to just terminating programs, and a new virtual memory system um, that wasn't, uh, well, essentially that allowed shared memory. Uh, the, the one, the, the predecessor uh, that we were running in BSD at that time uh, shared the text space, the read-only part of your program, but all the rest uh, could not be shared. So those were the four deliverables. Now, when it came to the networking, they still didn't really trust us. So they decided that what they were going to do was divide it in the, into two parts. So they were going to get uh, Bolt, Bermick, and Newman, BBNN, were going to actually write the TCP IP protocol stuff. And then what Berkeley was supposed to do was design the programming interface. Uh, so the socket, connect, accept, so on. And then BBNN was to deliver the thing that plugged in underneath that interface, and Berkeley was to integrate it into BSD, and um, then they would ship it. And uh, so this all starts, and BBNN gets to work. and uh, Bill Joy gets to work on the interface. And uh, so uh, eventually what happens is that Bill has sort of the framework of this stuff done. And Bill being Bill, uh, he, he worked rather quickly. Uh, someone once asked me to compare myself to Bill Joy. And I said, well, you know, there's really nothing that he's done that I couldn't do. But the problem is that what he gets done in a year would take me a decade. Because he was the master of figuring out, I'm here. That's where I want to get to, what is absolutely the shortest path from here to there. And he would do it. And you'd end up with code that worked, but was not maintainable, extendable, changeable. And anybody that looked at the older version of VI understands what I'm talking about. 
Um, so some of the rest of us, you know, like to have stuff that like you could go back and do something with later, but that takes longer. At any rate, Bill figured out this socket interface, the first draft of it at any rate, and he's got it, and now he needs the networking protocols to put underneath it. So he goes to, to uh, Rob Gerowitz, who was leading the program of development of TCP IP at BBNN, and says, hey, I got the socket interface. I need something to put in here. And Rob says, well, we're not really done yet, but yeah, we have this like prototype code, and you, know, you could put that in and see how that works, and you know, then we'll, we'll iterate um, so that we can you know, work in parallel here. So Bill gets the code, and he puts it in, and cranks it up and gets it kind of working, and then decides to run some little tests between machines to see how well it works. And we were running at, those, at that time, our development machines, development in quotes, were VAC 750s. So there was the big honking VAC 780 that ran at an entire MIP, and then there were these much smaller things that were merely the size of a large uh, dishwasher. dishwasher or it's bigger than a dishwasher, more like a washing machine. Stove range. Yes, uh, stove or range. At any rate, and used about as much power as the same, um, with all the burners turned on, assuming it's an electric. Uh, at any rate, the, the VAC 750 only ran at 0 0.7 MIPS. Uh, and so uh, Bill needs to be able to run some tests back and forth between these machines. And of course, we don't have anything like FTP or Telnet or any of that is not written yet. And so he just, you know, being Bill, says, well, I'll just you know, hack up something, uh, which was our login, RCP, et cetera, which was really just designed so that he could test running between these two machines. Uh, and it, you know, this is the legacy that we end up with. I mean, why put a protocol number or anything like that in the header? I mean, you know, it's just a test program, right? No one's going to actually use this. Um, so the, uh, the upshot of all this is that Bill fires up uh, RCP, and to copy a file between machines. And it copies the file at about 56 or 60 kilobits per second. And at that point, the CPU is pegged on the VAC 750. And it, you know, there's plenty of bandwidth still available because we had 10 megabit ethernet at that point. We had the new 10 megabit ethernet because mostly it was three megabit, but we had the 10, which was like really cool stuff. Uh, and uh, so he talks to Rob Gerwitz and says, you know, this thing only runs at this. And, and Gerwitz's attitude is, well, the backbone of the ARPANET is only 56K, so as long as we can saturate that, what's the problem? And Bill's attitude is, well, no, I need to be able to get, you know, closer to the bandwidth of the network between these local machines. And so, of course, Bill being Bill dives in to see why this is the case, that it's not running very fast. In fact, uh, GPROF, we wrote that to do some of this to figure out well what was not running quickly. We, we'd already had it for user level programs. That's when we ported it into the kernel. And uh, sad to say some of these tools that are still like considered leading tools, well not leading tools, but still used tools today. Um, which isn't to say it was bad. It's just that it seems like in 20 years you could do better. Um, <laughs> at any rate, he quickly discovers that the way the TCP IP code is written is it's this elaborate state machine. And there's these state transitions that you go through, and each time you want to do a state transition, you have to you know, jump through and indirect this and that and other things. And, and he goes, well, you know, this is just way too inefficient. You know? I mean, we could just take the state machine and turn it into a giant switch statement. And you know, there'll be a few go-tos here and there you know, to get from here to there when you need to switch states. But you know, you know, that's just, you know, we'll just do that. And so he starts cranking away on this thing and pounding out all of the the structure and getting it down to a lot like what it looks like today. And uh, <laughs> actually, it's been cleaned up considerably over the years. But uh, he, so he cranks it down to this and gets it up to the point where um, he can at least saturate the 3 megabit wire. And we can't saturate the 10 megabit wire, but it's because the actual Ethernet controllers themselves are not able to uh, really run at 10 megabits. Um, these were, you know, prototype early release stuff. And so we get it up to somewhere around 4 uh, megabit, um, but we're only running at 40% CPU time. So in theory, if we could have run at wire speed, we could have gotten it up to 10 megabit. I mean, you know, for other reasons, it probably wouldn't have. But the point is, we were like way, way, you know, order of magnitude ahead of where we'd started from, literally. And so 
uh, there's a lot of pressure from a lot of the uh, people that have been that have 4.1 that they want to try out this new networking stuff, and so um, the, this code, as such as it was, um, got released as something that we called 4.1a. Uh, so 4.1a was sort of the first incremental release of uh, you know between 4.1 and 4.2. And this got surprisingly large, larger distribution than we had really planned on, because you know you give it to one person, and then someone else hears about it, and they want it, and someone else wants it, and nah, nah, nah. Uh, it's not like today where you just put it up in you know anonymous FTP. This was still put it on a tape, mail the tape to somebody, you know, big you know nine track tapes, uh, and uh, if you weren't lucky enough to have a high density tape drive, a 6250 bits per inch tape drive, then you had to get the 1,604 tapes to get it all out there. Um, at any rate, uh, this, this code goes out, uh, and can measure it about this time, Sam Leffler, who's somebody's name you probably know in contemporary stuff having to do with wireless, uh, actually joined the CSRG, the group there, uh, and uh, he begins to help Bill with a rewrite of the networking interface. Um, in particular, uh, Bill hadn't quite cottoned on to the fact that uh, when you, you may want to have multiple connections uh, concurrently on a particular port. So if you're running SMTP service or HTTP, uh, the way he originally had it, except you know, the, 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 what we think of as the rendezvous socket today, actually connected. And so then nobody else could talk to you on that particular port until you were finished with that conversation, and then the, the socket would become free again and could have the next connection. And Sam's like, eh, no, 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 we got to like, have more than one at a time. And so that's when the whole listen and the rendezvous socket where accept returns a new connected socket and so on came in. Um, and so at any rate, uh, this, this all gets done. And uh, I had gotten roped into doing the file system, which is another part of the earlier story. Uh, and so the file system is sort of the point where we're ready to inflict it. I mean, let other users try it. And uh, we have the revised networking. And so this uh, came up as a release called 4.1b. And then fairly quickly thereafter, the signal stuff got cleaned up. And so 4.1b got replaced as 4.1c. Uh, remember, there were four things that were going to get done. So A was networking, B was the file system, C was the signaling, and D was supposed to be the virtual memory, which of course didn't happen for another six or seven years. Uh, but at any rate, 4.1c was another one of these ones, which was an interim release that got very wide distribution. Uh, and in, in the meantime, uh, you know, the folks at BBNN have continued uh, working and developing and polishing their code. Um, but Bill hadn't asked for another copy of it, and so you know, they hadn't delivered it because it wasn't really done yet anyway. Um, and they were just going to get it done, and uh, then they'd give it to Berkeley, and we could put it in as preparation for shipping 4.2. Well, 4.1c got out there, and uh, Bill then was setting about to, to work on the VM stuff, uh, when one day I go into his office to chat with him. He says, oh, come into my office, and uh, he says, you know, I'm, I'm involved with these other folks down at Stanford, and they have some hardware and they want to put Berkeley Unix on it and you know, start selling these things as workstations. And uh, you know, so I'm going, to, uh, you know, I'm going down there to you know, be one of the founding members of this, and you should come along uh, because you know, we can give you, you know, you'll be a single-digit employee and you'll get a huge stock option and it's going to be really exciting. And you know, I, I, at that time, had already completed my degree in business from uh, the University of California, so I knew something about business. In fact, I'd taken an entrepreneurial course, so I knew a lot about starting up companies, or so I thought. And so I said, well, you know, Bill, this all sounds good, but, you know, what, what is it that's going to make you so successful? Be and he's like, oh, well, it's the fact that, you know, we're not going to have vendor lock-in. You know, it's going to be running Unix, and... If you know Sun doesn't do it right, they can always go to another vendor and get Unix from them, and uh, you know that's that's going to be the story. And I said, well, you know, this is all well and good, but let me explain about workstations. Um, workstations is about the installed base of applications because people buy workstations because of the applications that run on it, and 
you know, there's this company, Apollo, that has, you know, a four-year head start on Sun, and they've got a lock on the applications, and people aren't going to switch to Sun because they need the applications that run on Apollo. So, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's going to be, you know, interesting, but, uh, uh, you know, I'm only a few months from finishing my PhD, and I know if I go to Sun with you, that won't happen, and so I'm going to finish my PhD, and we'll see how Sun is doing in, oh, six or eight months, and, you know, I'll reevaluate. Well, of course, it took me 14 or 15 months to finish my PhD, and of course, by that time, Sun had burst onto the scene and didn't have any particularly interesting stock options left. So, uh, uh, if you want advice about business, perhaps I'm not the one to ask. <laughs> At any rate, um, Bill left without doing the VM system, uh, and he took 4.1c with him to get it ported onto the, the Sun hardware. And with this sort of, you know, hit on the, the main developer, uh, we decided that rather than trying to get someone else up to speed and getting the VM done and so on, that we would instead uh, just declare the first three pieces of this four-piece contract uh, worth releasing. And so uh, uh, around this time, uh, this would be about June of 1983, um, Mike Carls joins the group essentially coming in um, to, re to replace, you know, into the position that was uh, formerly held by Sam, or Sam, uh, by Bill as the sort of uh, head of lead programmer. Uh, and because uh, Sam was also, Sam had considered taking that position, but ultimately decided that uh, he, he didn't want to do that. He was going to go off to do graphics at uh, Lucasfilm. And so the... Uh, now, the upshot of this was that uh, 4.2 got released in uh, about August of 83. And uh, there, uh, about 1,000 copies went out. But remember, for each copy that goes out, that's like you know, an institution gets a copy and they just you know, spread it across all their machines, et cetera. Um, another way of looking at it is you can look at the number of licenses that AT&T had outstanding and how many licenses that Berkeley had and about... Uh, at the time we had shipped 1,000, there were about 1,200 uh, AT&T licenses. So it says that a fair number of people were running it. Uh, now, at this point, just for context, uh, AT&T is releasing System 5 Release 1. So that's sort of where they are. Uh, you know, they had taken their file system and uh, upped the block size from 512 bytes to 1K. Uh, at any rate, uh, BBNN was very upset that their TCP IP had not been incorporated. I mean, here we had released it, but it was this, like, prototype early version that had been bastardized by Bill, and, like, you know, this isn't it. You know, DARPA paid us to do it, and we now have this shiny, wonderful TCP IP stack. You should be putting this in. And so they began agitating with DARPA and saying, look, you know, blah, 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 get this to happen. And so... Uh, Mike Carls, being the very deliberative sort of person that he is, says, okay, well, I'll take the TCP IP code from BBNN, I'll take the TCP code that we have in 4.2, and I'll evaluate both of them, you know, and the evaluation involves, you know, performance and maintainability and uh, functionality and all these various and sundry things, and he says, well, you know, the TCP, the IP that comes from BBNN, has some really good ideas in it that we don't have, so we'll just pick those up and drop it into our distribution. Um, but we don't really feel that their uh, code is, uh, you know, is the good place to start from. There's a lot of people at this point that have worked with the Berkeley code. They know that code base. There's been a huge amount of enhancements that have gone in it. Uh, there's this wonderful book that's been written all about it, uh, so it's very well documented. And it just doesn't seem to really make sense to, you know, reset back to here and then have to get all of those, you know, improvements, changes, et cetera, uh, into this particular new version. Um, it, I finally graduated in 84 and joined the project, uh, foolishly uh, taking over as, as technically the, as the lead, which meant that I got to deal with all of the political bullshit while Mike and others got to do lots of programming. Um, so let that be a lesson to you if you think that they're, they try and sweet talk you into how, how great it is to be in charge of things. Um, at any rate, um, we 
continued debating back and forth about this stuff with Bibi and Ann, and we kept taking stuff and putting it in and said, well, look, you know that, we've, we've taken that, we've taken that. No, no, you have to take the code, you've got to take the code. So at any rate, um, 4.3 uh, was really designed uh, much like 4.1 in the sense of consolidating what we already had. So it's sort of that the, the even-numbered releases from Berkeley had a lot of new functionality, and the odd releases uh, tried to really get the performance up. Uh, we, we were always striving to make sure that things worked when we released it, but we didn't always strive to make sure that they ran optimally, uh, figuring that it was better to sort of tune things uh, after the fact once you had it sort of work in the right way. So at any rate, we made an announcement of uh, 4.3, uh, actually at the June 1985 Eustinx conference. So two years basically have gone by here. Uh, and um, BBNN, you know, immediately objects that we have not taken their code. And uh, they go to DARPA and they say, look, you've paid BBNN how many millions of dollars, more than you've paid to Berkeley to do this code. You're going to, you know, and now they're not taking it. You know, and, and you know, you're going to look like ninnies or something. I don't know. I don't know what they said to them. I wasn't there. But at any rate, DARPA representative shows up in my office and um, very calmly uh, explains that, you know, the, the agreement was that BBNN was going to do the TCP IP code and uh, that Berkeley was going to do the interface. And... You know, this is this is the way of the world, and you know we appreciate that. You know, we had done other stuff, and it was it was great work. But you know, they're funding us, and this is the way it is. And Mike Carls is like, uh, you know, arguing with them and saying, "Well, look, you know, we've done this, and we've taken this out, and we put it over here, and you know, all the reasons that I gave you earlier." And and you know, the guy finally at the end just says, "No, you don't understand. We're in charge. This is what you're doing." Bye. And, well, you know, it just doesn't work very well at Berkeley to just come in and say, this is what you are going to do. I mean, it just, the free speech movement comes to mind. Uh, so, uh, you know, Mike in particular just goes completely bananas. It's like, and, and fires off, unbeknownst to me, fires off a thing to DARPA, um, which if I had been able, it's good that he didn't show it to me because I would not have let him send it. Uh, at any rate, um, I mean, I only see it because the DARPA guy sends it back to me and says, you need to keep your staff under control. Um, so at any rate, um, you know, Mike just says, I'm not doing it. They can't make me. I'll just leave, you know. And so, you know, you tell them that they can either have it this way or they can have it that way, you know, or we won't release it. And I'm like, oh, no, come on, there's got to be some compromise we can do here. So uh, finally I say, okay, let's, I propose that we have a bake-off. So we will, we, we had already incorporated in, so you could, there was a big switch, so you could compile it one way or the other. So our first proposal was we will just ship it with a compile time option. So you can compile for BBN code, you can compile for Berkeley code. Well, even, BB, even DARPA could see this was a no-win because we're, you were going to end up with some people running one, some people running the other. They weren't going to interoperate smoothly. This was just not where they wanted to go. And so we said, all right, well, the switch is there. It's really easy to compile the two different systems. Let's have a bake-off. You know, we'll have, you know, we'll you know, compile the, with one and we'll compile with the other and we'll run a bunch of tests and we'll you know, decide which one is better. Uh, well, of course, we're not going to let Berkeley do the testing because they'd be biased for Berkeley. And we're not going to let BBN do the testing because they'd be biased to BBNN. So we have to find a, uh, a third party. And uh, the third party that DARPA actually proposes is a guy named Mike Moose at the Ballistics Research Laboratory just up the road from here. And uh, little known to most people is that we actually knew Mike Moose very well because we'd interacted a whole lot with him on working on TCP IP. So we're like, no, fine, yeah. yeah it's fine with us. <laughs> and, you know, he was in the military, you know, chain of command and BBNN, you know, muck and mucks knew him, so they were fine with it. And so, okay, great. So, you know, off we ship the tape and uh, he doesn't even tell us what tests are going to be on. You know, neither side gets to do anything other than make some suggestions, general suggestions. You know. So, of course, we suggest a throughput performance test would be important, and BBNN suggests that uh, 
uh, how well it works in the face of large packet rate losses is important. Uh, because, of course, to the military, you know, you drop a nuclear bomb on Chicago. We want to make sure it routes down through Dallas. Um, at any rate, um, so Mike Moose sets up these, these systems and runs a bunch of tests. And, of course, without talking to either side. And so we're sort of on pins and needles because it's, you know, several weeks goes by. And finally, the, his report lands, you know, <laughs> comes in the mail. Here's his report. And... You know, of course, the first thing you want to do is you flip to the last page to see what the conclusion is, but he knew that's what we were going to do, so he hid the conclusion somewhere in the middle, <laughs> <laughs> forcing you to read the entire thing. But it's a, it's a very interesting read because uh, in terms of the throughput, of course, as we expected, we did better. Uh, but then he introduced a thing where it would randomly drop about every fourth packet. And uh, under this scenario, he says... Uh, the BBN code uh, jumps out to an early start, getting a lot more data through in the face of high packet loss. Um, he said, but, but the Berkeley code manages to catch up while the BBN machine reboots. Um, <laughs> uh, ultimately resulting in the conclusion that even in the face of uh, uh, packet loss that the, the Berkeley code seems to do a little better. Uh, and so his conclusion is that it should continue to ship with the BSD code. Uh, so with this result in hand, uh, we are authorized by DARPA to do the release, and uh, we finally managed to release uh, 4.3 uh, in June of 1986. So at this point, uh, the, the, the new TCP code has gone out, uh, or the, you know, the, the, the revised BSD TCP code has gone out. Yeah? With or without subnets? With or without? Subnets. Uh, that had, well, the, the class ABC type of subnets, not, what, not the uh, cider stuff. Cider, cider, cider came along. I know that cider is much bigger. It's just really not. Yeah. Sorry. 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 Okay, um, so at any rate, uh, now we'll start accelerating the story a bit again because I have to finish in eight minutes. Um, so at this point, um, Keith Bostick comes to, comes to Berkeley. Uh, he had been at Seismo, which some of you may know. Uh, and this, this is in the fall of 1986. So we've, we've released 4.3 at this point. We're just getting cranked up to work on 4.4. Um, you remember that VM thing? And uh, by this time, there's this other little protocol, uh, NFS, you may have heard of it, uh, and it was felt that we ought to have that as well. Uh, so we, we bring Keith Bostick on board, and one of his uh, requirements for coming is that we have to agree to allow him to finish the port of 2.11 to the PDP-11. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a real challenge to get a kernel, which at that point was about just under 200 kilobytes of text to fit onto a machine that has a maximum amount of program space of 64 kilobytes. Uh, because what you have to do is you have to break it into overlays, and then you map in the overlay, for, and the, the granularity of mapping is 4K, so there's really only eight pieces that you can remap. Uh, Mike and I's attitude is, you know, that's an incredibly challenging pro problem, and it's probably, you know, intellectually very stimulating, but there's no way in how we would do that. But if you want to do it, you know, by all means, you know, you can do that in your spare time. Um, there's only three jobs you need to do. Uh, one is you, you need to be the, the answer the phone uh, for things other than distributions, like technical questions. Uh, answer the incoming email stream for technical questions. Uh, do some programming, and then in your spare time, you can work on the PDP-11. Um, and no, he was, had no other support for the phones or the email. Um, and we had, you know, by this time, about 2,000 uh, distributions. So uh, at any rate, uh, Keith d did, in fact, finally finish the PDP-11 uh, port and got 2.11 out the door. And we had a little party to celebrate the fact that he had completed this. And part of the party was opening the window on the fourth floor of our uh, building and taking his PDP-11 and ceremoniously dropping it out on the window to the cement sidewalk <laughs> four stories below to ensure that he would never work on it again. <laughs> this was him doing this, not us. <laughs> uh, at any rate, um, 
Keith, of course, being in the frontline uh, support, uh, had a lot of feedback from various users. Um, in particular, there were a number of vendors that were trying to build uh, these network cards that you could plug into a PC that would provide TCP IP networking. And of course, the PC was way too feeble to actually run the code in the PC itself, so they had an outboard processor on the card, and they would put the TCP IP in there, and then it would just sort of look uh, like a, a, you know, a file or some kind of device on the PC, and so they would just open this thing and get connected to the network. And so, of course, they wanted the TCP IP code from Berkeley, along with the, the important utilities like oh, our login and uh, RCP, and uh, by that time, finally, FTP and Telnet. Um, and uh, they didn't, I mean, our standard thing was, well, you know, just buy a distribution and take whatever you need out of it, but that meant they had to get an AT&T license. Well, by the late 80s, the AT&T licenses were up to like a quarter million dollars, and when you're in a little commodity PC business, a quarter million dollar cost just to get the software before you do anything with it was just a non-starter for them. And so we were getting requests for just that TCP IP code and associated utilities. Uh, clearly, since it had all been developed at Berkeley, there was none of that in the original version 7 Unix that we'd started from. Uh, AT&T couldn't lay any claim to that. And so we talked to the lawyers at Berkeley, and they're like, well, how can we make money on this? And uh, Because that's what they were paid to say. And so we pointed out to them that it had been developed under government contract, and we showed them the government contract saying that, you know, this stuff done under this contract has to be made available to the public at reasonable costs or whatever it said. And uh, so it didn't really say that, but we convinced the lawyers that it did. And so they agreed to let us pull out this chunk of Berkeley code and re release that uh, under this new license that the lawyers cooked up, uh, which is the one that we today think of as the BSD license. And, of course, our goal was to be absolutely as, you know, free to give it away as we possibly could. So, really, the only thing you had to do was give due credit to Berkeley. Uh, so, this was networking release one, and uh, it was a wild success. Uh, the amazing thing was that we sold $1,000. You could buy it from Berkeley for $1,000, or you could just download it off of UUNet for free. And yet, 1,000 people chose to pay $1,000 to Berkeley to get it. And the only difference was that you got a nine-track tape, which many people didn't have any way of reading, and a, uh, uh, a piece of paper signed by the Berkeley lawyers essentially saying, yes, you can use this. And that's what they were paying the $1,000 for. And the lawyers, of course, got paid something like $100 for every one of these that they signed because of, you know, well, overhead, etc. So they thought this was the cat's pajamas. You know, maybe the campus wasn't making a lot of money, but their office was doing just fine. Thank you very much. So uh, at any rate, uh, Net One was wildly successful. And so there was pressure. It's, you know, we, Keith would come in and say, oh, well, someone today wants a VI, or somebody wants this, or somebody wants that. And, you know, really, we ought to do this. And, uh, you know, how about you know, figuring out other parts of the kernel? And Mike and I would, Mike Carls and I would sort of look at each other, and we look at Keith, you know, it's like, yeah, 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 right. Um, well, you figure out, you know, I mean, you know, this all entangled with the C library and all this and that. So we get to the, the conferences, and Keith is putting up, you know, this huge list of utilities. You know, rewrite this utility and get your name in lights, you know. And uh, uh, so the, he would get this stuff sent into him. And he would almost always just sort of take it and then bash it into Keith's normal form, uh, which usually didn't look a lot like what he'd gotten. But it started from clean, so that was, you know, that was good. And, uh, you know, it was sort of easy, you know, the, the first stuff, you know, someone sends in cat, and, you know, someone, like, really goes whole hog and does all the options to LS. And uh, you know, this was in the days before GNU software when, you know, lots of options were in vogue. Um, and uh, then... One day, uh, Keith comes in to report that somebody is redoing uh, the T. Roth family. And this is when Mike and I sort of look at each other and sort of gulp. Because the next question out of Keith's mouth is, and how's that kernel coming, guys? Well, we can't go to a Usenix conference and say, rewrite the kernel, get your name in lights, you know? So we actually have to, like, go through it and figure out what's Berkeley and what's not Berkeley and segregate stuff out. Uh, long story, but uh, eventually we get something that we feel is clean. And uh, 
So we go back to the lawyers and say, oh, we got this little update to the networking tape that we'd like to do. Um, uh, we're we're going to call it networking release two, net two. And so actually we do sort of come on and explain that it is practically the entire system and lots of stuff happens, but they finally sign off on it and we put it out there. And it's out there for a good half a year before BSDI sort of fills in the missing bits and starts selling it. And they, you know, engineers are not really that good at marketing. And so, in particular, they think that these sort of cutesy things like having your phone number be 1-800-IT'S-UNIX and ads that say 99% off the price that AT&T charges for source code um, are cute. <laughs> but it really irritates the piss out of AT&T. <laughs> and so they sue us. Imagine that. Well, actually, they sue BSDI. And BSDI says, well, we only added these six files. You know, All the rest came from Berkeley. So we'll be happy to talk to you about any of these six files that you'd like to, uh, but otherwise, you know, forget it. And the judge agrees with them because they don't have any problem about those six files. And so there's no choice but to sue the university. And uh, that's another long story in which I become an expert witness, uh, which has actually proven to be a, a relatively lucrative thing because being an expert witness is something that you, it's really hard to break into that because no one wants to hire someone that hasn't done it before. Uh, and it turns out it doesn't really matter how much you know. It's really, you know, do you have a, a PhD? Because if you have a PhD, by definition, you must know what you're talking about. I'm not making this up. And uh, then number two is how well do you speak in public, uh, you know, especially people harassing you. Well, I've had 10,000 students, you know. There's not a question that a graduate student hasn't asked me that I haven't had to deal with. And a lawyer is not up to a graduate student. <laughs> so I did pretty well on that score, too. Um, and so because I, they, they were forced to use me in this case, uh, and, but I did well enough that then the lawyer, the outside lawyer that Berkeley, you know, got me to do some other stuff. And uh, one thing leads to another. And so today I'm, uh, I'm an expert in the network appliance versus Sun Microsystem Waffle versus ZFS lawsuit, which is uh, an interesting story that you can ask over beer. <laughs> At any rate, um, we eventually win the, the lawsuit. And uh, no, we don't win it. We settle the lawsuit. Excuse me, I have to use the proper terminology here. Uh, we have to agree that networking release two did in fact have things in it that infringed. Uh, and however, um, the the things that infringed were sufficiently minor that with some changes uh, we can get something that's clean. So we agree that we will re-release. We'll do a new release that has all these changes made in it as 4.4 BSD light. So there's 4.4 BSD, which is the whole thing, complete with AT&T stuff and needs an AT&T license, and 4.4 BSD Lite, which has got the, stuff, the AT&T stuff stripped out of it. And AT&T really thought they'd won big time because all these people had been using Net2. They were going to be forced to throw it out because we weren't allowed to tell them what the changes were and have to start all over again from Lite. And the uh, Bill Jolitz in particular just never did that, and so that's why his distribution got hammered. Uh, FreeBSD had to do it, the NetBSD folks had to do it, uh, and it was a huge amount of work, but they did it. And it was great because then we got two more years worth of our technology out. Um, at any rate, uh, that we actually did one more sort of incremental release, Lite 2, uh, which just fixed some of the most egregious bugs. Because what had happened was we'd gotten all these people that had bought these BSD Lite licenses because they wanted to pay the $1,000 to get the piece of paper saying, and this one's fine too. And uh, so we had a chunk of money, and so Keith and I just sort of worked through that money uh, and uh, just spent it essentially doing bug fixes and stuff on light. Finally released that when the money ran out, and then we left the university, and that was the last release uh, from, from Berkeley. And that is the end of my story. So any questions? Yes? You mentioned how the VMs Sorry, I, the, the VM system. system. Oh, yeah. VM system, yes. Um, so the VM system was actually sort of an interesting story. Uh, actually, both VM and NFS were interesting stories. The, the VM system, uh, one of our attitudes was always, you know, why come up with a good idea when you can steal a better one? 
<laughs> and, you know, I mean, it's just a lot of work to write a VM system, as you know, the NetBSD folks clearly know. And uh, so we looked around to see if there was anything that we could use rather than having to write it from scratch ourselves. And there were evaluated two different things. One was uh, the, the stuff that Sun had done, and the other was the stuff that had been done at Carnegie Mellon under the, the Mox thing. And they had done a, a lot of very good work on the VM system. We didn't really agree with the microkernel principle, but we liked the VM system. And so we talked to Sun about potentially contributing a chunk of their VM system. We talked to them about contributing a chunk of their VFS stuff. Uh, we knew that we couldn't get NFS from them, but uh, the, the, you know, the folks at Sun sort of in the engineering were enthusiastic about it, and it sort of percolated all the way up to Scott McNeely, who was the CEO at that time. And even Scott McNeely was pretty enthusiastic about giving this stuff to Berkeley, you know, as long as Sun would get credit for it. And uh, so it really got to the point where it just needed to be signed off by the, the Sun lawyers. And uh, they, so they sent it off to them, and the Sun lawyers came back and said, well, you know, your stockholders could accuse you of giving away company property and, and sue you in court. And we, we really don't recommend that you do this. And so at the very last minute, it was we couldn't get any of that stuff from Sun. So we ended up adopting the stuff from Mach, the Mach VM system. And uh, so it fell to myself to take that and figure out essentially how to plug it in. And the problem was the old VM system was very portable provided you were porting it to something that looked a lot like a VAX. <laughs> because it would came down to, you know, the, the, the basic page data structure was the VAX page data structure. And so when people would port it, if they had something where the page data structure looked different, they would take it from the, the VAX and they'd shuffle the bits around and put it in the right order and then drop it into whatever that architecture was page table. So it worked pretty well for porting it to the Motorola uh, because the MMU on that looked a lot like the VAX and uh, some other machines. But in other ways, it just really didn't cut it at all. Whereas the VM that had been done by the, the folks at CMU in Mach was uh, you know, very elegantly designed uh, and in fact, it had in some ways too many bells and whistles and too many options in it because there were a lot of sort of dead ends that they just sort of left hanging there. Um, but uh, the structure itself was nicely done. It was about 90% machine independent code, 10% machine dependent code to the and well-defined interface, the PMAP interface. And so got that put in. Of course, we did it onto the, the Berkeley MMAP interface rather than what they did um, with the ports and so on. Um, and so we got, I got that together uh, sort of in the 4.3 the, the phase. I didn't talk about there were two releases between 4.3 and 4.4, 4.3 uh, Tahoe and 4.3 Reno, um, the first of them having the VM and the second one having the NFS in it. And uh, so that got put out, and then luckily, you know, people in the field sort of looked at it and said, well, you know, this really needs, like, a lot of work. And so Mike Hibbler at the University of Utah did a tremendous amount of cleanup in it and uh, then later, actually, after we released it as light in FreeBSD, David Greenman uh, did a, a whole lot more work on it, really just sort of throwing tons of shit out that shouldn't have been there in the first place. I had this whole notion of an external user-driven pager, which was nice, but the cost of all the extra context switching and other things that would happen on a page fault was sort of killer. Um, and so, uh, at any rate, that's, that's how the VM system got in there. Any more questions? See, I can take like five minutes to answer one question. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much.